everybody. Welcome today. I am Alyssa Raid. I'm the Chief Sustainability Officer at Sustain Life. Um, and a reminder on why we're all here today. Um, we're going to talk about calculating your carbon footprint and what you really need to know to get started. Um, and this is a difficult topic to really wrap your head around if, you know, emissions accounting, if you're new to sustainability, if you're new to emissions, and if you're not a sustainability expert. So we really want to make it easy for businesses to engage uh, in taking action towards their climate impact and understanding their emissions footprint, um, because it's all hands on deck if we're going to fix climate change. And that means that every business really needs to know how to understand their impact on the environment. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Just a little bit on the agenda. Um, so I know you're all interested in talking about carbon accounting before we jump in and talk about the numbers and the real nitty gritty mechanics of how that works. I just wanna spend some time really framing the ins and outs of what carbon accounting is and how to think about this for your business. Um, then we'll go through a walkthrough on the Sustain Life Emissions Management Platform. And we're actually gonna take a deep dive into some calculators to show you how you can actually get these numbers for your business, either as a high level estimate if you're just getting started, as well as what kind of data you need to collect to get really refined and granular numbers that accurately reflect your business operations. And then we'll end with a Q&A. Okay, so without further ado, let's get started. Um, if you're here today, you likely want to calculate your business's carbon footprint, uh, but perhaps you haven't done that yet. And uh, maybe you're overwhelmed, you don't know exactly where to start, you're lost. Uh, maybe you're not a sustainability expert and your boss or your CEO or manager has put this on your plate um, for you to do this year. Or maybe you are familiar with carbon accounting, but you just don't have the time and the resources to actually do this. Um, for your business and put together a comprehensive greenhouse gas inventory. And that's where we come in. Um, so just a little bit on Sustain. We are a platform that really wants to democratize sustainability and make it easier for businesses to get involved and start taking action towards their climate goals. Uh, we really want to lower that entry barrier for businesses to get started and take action today. And we've centered the platform around three primary um, features here, and that's measure, manage, and report. So if we think about measurement, you can't manage what you don't measure, right? That's a, an old adage um, common in the sustainability field. And so we provide businesses with a baseline to understand their impact, both from a carbon perspective, as well as other environmental indicators like energy, water, waste, because beyond carbon, that's really what we're talking about is how much of these resources are we consuming? And then how much carbon does that add up to at the end? And we often see that, especially with businesses just getting started with sustainability, you'll see a faster ROI for those other environmental indicators and programs and initiatives that focus on energy savings or water savings before you might really see a financial tie to your carbon performance. Um, and then just a little bit on management. So measurement is critical. It's really important to understand where you're starting, get a sense of your numbers so that you can you know, measure your impact over time. But what we're really talking about here is managing that impact, right? We want those numbers to go down. And so our fully featured platform provides step-by-step -step guidance across over a hundred actions to help businesses bring those numbers down across those areas like energy, water, waste, and a whole lot more. So we offer strategies and resources, tactical tools to really help businesses um, start these programs at their organization. And that includes things like customizable policy language, um, tools and templates, um, third-party rating systems that help um, disclose your ESG performance. And so that's where we get into reporting because we want businesses to be able to take, um, to take credit for all the incredible work they're doing. Um, it's so important to be transparent about your journey. And we find that businesses sometimes are almost hesitant to talk about their initiatives or programs publicly because they either feel almost a little intimidated that maybe they don't have a net zero goal or they haven't quite figured out exactly how they're gonna fix their business's climate impact. And that's okay, we're all figuring this out in this field. What's important is to really share your journey and be transparent about how you're looking at your business, what challenges you've come across, where you've decided to really focus. And so it's really that framing and those communication tools that we wanna to provide to businesses so that they can, be they can celebrate and be celebrated for all of the progress that they're making on this journey. Okay, and with that, uh, let's, get, let's get it started here. Enough about sustain, right? So why are we here today? We wanna to talk about emissions accounting. Um, there's a lot of terms that go into this. You might have, you might have often heard um, emissions footprint, carbon footprint, carbon accounting, um, emissions inventory, carbon inventory, and sometimes we just use the shorthand carbon. 
But what we're talking about here is quantifying the greenhouse gases that your business emits from all of its activities and everything that it takes to operate. So we're gonna take a step back even further. Greenhouse gases, you probably remember this term from, grads, from, from uh, grade school, but what are we talking about here? These are gases that occur naturally in the atmosphere and they act as an insulating blanket. And so as energy comes down from the sun, a lot of that gets absorbed by the earth, but a lot of it actually bounces back, which we call reflection. And it's greenhouse gases in the atmosphere that trap that energy, which is in the form of heat, from escaping back out into space and act as that blanket to actually keep the earth warm. So greenhouse gases are naturally occurring. They are what allow earth to be a habitable planet compared to others. But as we all know, they have drastically increased in concentration since the industrial revolution from the combustion or burning of fossil fuels. Okay, so now let's talk about the greenhouse gases. When we think about global warming, we often think about carbon dioxide, but that's actually just one of the greenhouse gases. There's a whole bunch of other ones. And this includes gases like methane, which is a common release from um, agricultural livestock, think of cows, um, as well as nitrous oxide, which is the most common pollutant that comes out of a car engine tailpipe. And then there's a whole other class of gases called fluorinated gases. And these are man-made greenhouse gases. They do not occur naturally in the atmosphere. And they're very common emissions from industrial processes. They're often used um, in refrigerants. And so what carbon accounting does is it takes all of these different greenhouse gases, each of which have a bit of a different impact um, in global warming, and it relates them, it rolls them all up into a common unit of measure, which we call CO2E or carbon dioxide equivalent. And this is why we call it accounting, because there is a little bit of math involved in how to get all of these gases into this uh, CO2E factor. And so if we really want to get into the weeds on that, CO2E, which by the way, we measure in metric tons is the most common unit. Um, it is all a function of global warming potential or GWP. And all that is, is a measure of the heat that each of those gases is capable of absorbing over a certain period of time in the atmosphere. So let's just walk through an example here. Let's look at methane. Methane has a global warming potential of 28 which means it's 28 times as powerful of an insulator as CO2. It can trap the heat 28 times as effectively as carbon dioxide, meaning that a single unit measure, one metric ton, for instance, of methane would be 28 metric tons of CO2E, of CO2 equivalents. So if methane is a more powerful greenhouse gas and insulator than carbon dioxide, and it's important to note that those other gases I mentioned can have global warming potential in the thousands so if all of them are such stronger insulators than CO2, why do we always talk about carbon dioxide and not these other gases? And that's because these other gases, while they're much stronger in terms of an insulator, they're also a lot less stable, meaning they stick around in the atmosphere for a much shorter period of time. They bounce around, they bump into other molecules, and they break down into other compounds that are not greenhouse gases. And so over the long run, carbon dioxide, which stays in the atmosphere for thousands of years, is ultimately the most critical greenhouse gas. And that's how we've arrived at CO2E. Okay, so that's where we're gonna stick with the numbers for the day. And now I wanna get into some classification. When we think of emissions at a very high level, you can break them into two buckets, and that's direct emissions and indirect emissions. So direct emissions is everything, is all the activities that your business controls. And I just want you to think of this as any time your business is directly responsible for burning the, um, burning the fossil fuels themselves. So think about this as fuel that's used in company cars that your company owns, um, fuel that's used to power buildings, whether that's natural gas, um, as well as any fuel that's used to power equipment. Uh, that could be propane, diesel. But this again is anytime your business is actually burning that fuel. And then we have indirect emissions. And these are from activities that support your business operations, but they're outside of your control. So it's not your business directly burning those fossil fuels. And the easiest example to remember for this is electricity. So even though your business consumes electricity, it consumes that power and those electrons, it's not responsible for actually generating it. That happens offsite at a power plant. So that's an example of an indirect emission. And now we further break down these indirect emissions into two categories, upstream and downstream. So upstream is everything that your business purchases or acquires. And that's where electricity would come in because you pay the utility bill, you purchase that electricity, as well as everything from downstream, 
which is anything related to um, the good or service that your business creates or sells. So there's lots of different examples of these, but one is, let's say you are a professional services provider and your staff often goes to client meetings, um, not in company owned cars, but on a subway, on a, on a, in a taxi cab, all of the emissions from those modes of transit are downstream um, emissions because it reflects um, the good or service, the service that you're providing and emissions that come um, to support that, even though, again, it's not your business directly burning those fuels. Okay, so that's direct and indirect. Now we're gonna go one step further and we're gonna talk about scopes, AKA scopes one, two, and three. And I want you to think of these as just a standard framework that helps businesses bucket emissions into more granular categories. And I have a little shorthand to help you remember these. It's gotten me through uh, much of my career when I was really trying to get down the nomenclature and just navigate the whole landscape of emissions accounting. So let's start with scope one. And I want you to think of this as burn, okay? So scope one are those direct emissions that we spoke about. This is any time that your business is burning the fuel. It's the gasoline in the cars. It's the diesel in the equipment. Um, it's any time that your business is actually burning the fuel, okay? Then we have scope two. Scope two, I want you to think of as buy. So this is again, that electricity, it could also include things like purchased heating, cooling, or steam. This is energy that your business is buying, but not generating or burning fuel to create directly. Okay, and here's a little example of how that winds up. And then we're gonna move into the more nebulous, the scope three. And I want you to think of this as beyond. Scope three is everything that it takes your business to operate outside of energy. Everything that happens in its value chain, whether that's customers, employees, other stakeholders, all of the activities. And these are really nebulous. There's 15 categories of scope three emissions. Um, and again, they can occur, occur upstream or downstream. So just to give an example of what this looks like in a sample business, um, let's take, for example, something like a t-shirt manufacturer. So if they were to look and start calculating their emissions inventory, they would start with scope one and two. And that's generally where businesses start because again, it reflects energy consumption. So it's easy to measure, it's easy to understand, it's easy to get access to that data and to again, measure and include in this inventory. So a scope one emission for them, these direct emissions might be um, if they are uh, utilizing diesel um, to power the equipment in their factory where they make t-shirts. Um, that would be an example of scope one. It could also be if they are burning heating oil um, in that factory um, to provide heat for their employees um, while they work. Then if they were to look at their scope two indirect, let's say they were purchasing electricity to keep the lights on, to power other electric equipment. Those would be examples of scope one and two. And again, that's a great place to start. That's the critical place to start if you're just starting out. But the scope three emissions, a little spoiler alert, that's really where most of business emissions come from. Unless you are a heavy real estate or physical asset owner where you're burning a lot of that fuel yourself, most business emissions, as much as 90%, come from these more nebulous scope three categories. And so what's so critical is to look throughout your value chain and understand okay, where should we start measuring these things? So in the example of the t-shirt manufacturer, examples of scope three could include um, the energy that their suppliers use in the extraction and the harvesting and the processing of the, of the fibers that eventually become the cotton textile that comprise these t-shirts, as well as um, the vehicle miles it takes the transit miles to get that cotton material to the factory to actually be made into the t-shirts. And then on the other side, on that downstream side, at the end of the useful life of these t-shirts, once they're unfortunately maybe not recycled or reused, but go into a landfill and are thrown in the trash, the emissions that come out of the decomposition of that um, t-shirt as it breaks down over time. And those are just some examples of what to include um, in a scope three um, emissions category. So if that sounds confusing, um, I wanna take you through the Sustain Life Emissions Tracker to help you understand the kind of tools that are available to help businesses navigate as you start with your emissions profile. Okay, so here is our emissions tracker. Um, and this lands you, you should see some now what is familiar um, nomenclature and classification here. You have scope one, two, and three, and all the different options of what you could be calculating. And so you take a look through and you read these and you just determine what applies to my business. 
Do I have um, equipment where I am burning fuel and there's stationary combustion? Do I own a vehicle fleet where we're burning our own gas and company owned cars? And so you go through and you take a look at these. And that's what's so critical with this scope three screening um, is to take a look and understand which of these apply to your organization. And then you can go ahead and you can start calculating. And this drops you into our, um, to our dashboard here. And I've already entered some information here. We're just in a test account. Um, but you can see measured emissions over time across those scope categories and, and um, see that reduction over time. And this is right where you can enter the data. So let's walk through a couple calculators just to understand what does it actually look like when we start to measure these things in practice, um, ideally on a monthly basis so you don't fall too far behind on your uh, data collection. That's generally for a lot of these when you're gonna wanna be um, collecting data, even though often from a reporting standpoint, you may be reporting on something like an annual cadence. Um, so let's go through purchase electricity. I've, I've already entered a lot of information here, but let's go ahead and open this. And so this is our calculator that pops up. And so when you're ready to calculate, let's just think about what best describes your facility. So let's say, um, let's stick with that t-shirt example. Let's say it's a manufacturing facility. Um, who knows, maybe it's 100,000 square feet. Um, based here in, in Brooklyn where I'm dialing in from today. And then this is what's so important is the ability of whether you have access to this data or not. So if you do have access to data, let's say you're not just starting out, you've done your homework, you knew that you came in to calculate electricity emissions, you can go in and put in right here your kilowatt hours if you have your utility bills. And you can do that from your typical utility bills. And if you have any renewables, you can enter that data right here. But for the most part, if you're joining this webinar, you may not have, you may just be starting out. So you may not have access to the information. You're just doing that first one screening process. You're trying to understand how do my emissions from different categories ladder up against each other so that you can understand where your business is actually having its biggest climate and emissions impact. So you can just estimate here and we'll do the work for you. And you can calculate and we can say based off of the building typology, the square footage, just that limited information that you've provided, um, 59.99 metric tons of CO2, great. So we can go ahead and we can record that. And that's it, that's how you get started in understanding where your emissions come from. And then as again, you, um, after you do these screenings and you're ready to really engage with the real data, go look for those utility bills and you can enter them here and we'll give you the emissions reflective of your actual electricity consumption. Um, I wanna take you through another one. Let's go with employee commuting. Cause again, this one's pretty approachable. Everybody has employees, they're commuting, not as much these days as they used to, <laughs> but let's see. So let's say that this factory has, um, I don't know, maybe they've got 500 employees. Um, and how many of them work remote? Um, none of them, cause it's factory. And so they have to be there. But again, if this was an office or a different kind of environment, you can provide this kind of general information to understand, okay, we used to be all in office, but you know, now we're hybrid or now we're mostly remote and you can enter these details here. Um, and so again, this is the opportunity where if you have the actual data, let's say you've done a commuter survey and that's something that in that fully featured platform I mentioned in Sustain, we have these kinds of tools and resources to guide you through how to conduct a commuter survey, what kind of a survey function to use that's integrated directly in the, in the platform. So let's say you've gone ahead and you've done that and you've measured all of the vehicle passenger miles um, you know, that, that folks are driving in aggregate, all the commuter rail and bus miles. We can go ahead and give you the actual emissions reflective of all of those behaviors. But again, for those just starting out, if we're doing this base level screening and we're just trying to understand, I have no idea how my commuting emissions ladder up against my electricity emissions. You can go in and put something representative here and say, you know, it's a pretty remote factory. Maybe we're saying, 50% uh, of folks are driving in their own personal vehicles and then you know, maybe split the difference um, and a quarter are taking these public modes. And you can make some you know, best judgments about where you know your locations are, are uh, located. And again, you can go ahead and calculate and see how that ladders up. And here we have 72.8. So it shows you that you might think, oh, electricity, that's, um, per that's a purchased, um, Sorry, you might think electricity, that's energy that we're consuming. That's gotta be where most of our emissions are coming from. And you may not realize that actually the way that that ladders up against this employee commuting is that commuting actually has a huge impact. So if you're looking at how to manage that over time, it may actually make sense before pursuing energy efficiency measures to focus on some um, transit benefit programs for your employees. Is there a kind of company shuttle you could offer? 
um, you know, other kinds of programs that could help bring this number down because it's actually a bigger number than your electricity emissions. Um, and again, it's those kind of strategies that in the fully featured platform for sustain, um, that's what would be offered and to help you move through that kind of operational and program programmatic um, offerings throughout your workforce. Um, and that's what I wanted to show you in the demo today. Now I can entertain some Q&A. Let me just pull up that function here. How would we track scope two emissions in a shared lease building where each shared unit company does not have access to data on energy and water consumption? That's a really great question because it goes to that question on um, data availability. And so again, it's those kinds of um, guidelines on what you would find in the, in the fully featured um, action. We actually have an action around how to measure your electricity consumption. And one of the scenarios that we offer is you're in a multi-tenanted building. You are just one of many companies. You don't have, uh, you don't control a master meter. Your landlord has energy, you know, maybe your landlord has energy data or maybe they don't and that you just pay your bill through what's called an electric rent inclusion. And so just per square foot, you pay a flat fee, a flat fee um, every month. And it's just, uh, you don't have actual consumption details. Um, so in those cases, that's where the estimation tool really helps in sustained life because we're actually pulling from industry data to say, okay, based off of other offices in your region of your size, this is um, about how much energy they consume. And so we can actually benchmark you against peer data so that you, you know, it's better than starting with, with nothing. Great. How accurate are the calculations of say the commuter data? Um, so I'd say they're pretty accurate. So um, we're pretty transparent on all of our methodologies from our calculators. So um, you can access that through the, the full platform and I, I encourage everybody to do so. Um, but yeah, when we're looking at that, um, commuting information is, is really interesting, but we're looking at the emissions from rail, from bus. We're actually launching new features that includes ferry and e-bikes, um, as well as including in that commuter survey, your carbon-free modes like biking, right? Because if you develop a bike program or you invest money in a capital project to build a bike room for your team or for your employees, you're gonna wanna see, are you actually you know, having increased bikers um, and increased mileage from there and seeing a reduction in the mileage of maybe the individual car commuting or something like that. Um, I do see a question here about an example of the tools that help with collecting data, like a commuter survey. We're not going to focus on that today, um, but we are planning on hosting subsequent webinars. And so that's great fodder. We can definitely spend some time um, in subsequent ones walking through um, some of that, some of the collection tools that are in app and how to actually utilize these in your organization um, and run some of these programs. Okay, let me see some other ones. Okay. Um, how is data typically collected and how is it best used as a metric to evaluate company performance at reducing greenhouse gases? So yeah, the data collection is a really big piece for this and the guidelines on how to look through your organization, what data to collect to engage in that higher, higher touch um, aspect of the calculators that we walked through. Part of it is partially intuitive, right? So you saw on the higher level for commuting, for instance, okay, I'm gonna need to know the total miles that my employees um, traveled on each of these modes of, of transit. But again, for more of that kind of handholding and the step-by-step -step implementation guidance, that's the content that's included in the actions. And that's what is so, I think, critically important in really upskilling you as employees to run these programs at your organizations and step up and become that sustainability manager, that sustainability professional that, again, maybe your boss or, you know, a green team or someone has nominated um, you to do. Okay, what else do we have here? Um, where do you typically get the data associated with scope three emissions? Which type of carbon accounting methodology do you utilize to quantify scope three emissions? That's great. So we follow the greenhouse gas protocol in our emissions calculator, which is really known as the gold standard for how to approach carbon accounting. It um, is what serves as the backbone for all of the reporting standards in how you wanna be reporting your emissions. And so that's what's built into the calculators here. Let's see how to calculate carbon footprint for a service-based company, which is not a manufacturer. Great question. Oftentimes we think of these emissions as, okay, well, you know, I'm a manufacturer, I'm, I'm making a good, I know that there's all these materials and ingredients, but if you're a service provider, um, and there was an example I gave earlier, thinking about 
okay, what are our emissions from? Do you have an office? Do you still occupy a physical space? Are you purchasing that electricity? So still thinking about those um, scope two emissions um, as well as any scope one emissions from that space. Um, and then looking at your scope three, again, doing that screening process to say, okay, well, are my employees commuting? Do we have business travel? If I'm a service provider, are you sending folks on airplanes to support clients or maybe on public modes of transportation, rail, bus, um, looking through those and determining, okay, which of these activities does our business actually do? And then running through those calculators on that estimated level. And that's really your benchmark. That's your screener so that you can determine, okay, I've done these calculations and it looks like these five scope three areas are really what's most critical to our business. That's where we're seeing a lot of our emissions. And then over time, you can start to collect the data to refine those numbers so that they'll actually reflect your business decisions and actions. Okay, let's see next one. Realistic timeline for corporate shift to net zero and costs involved. Hmm, that's a good one. Um, so just anyone who doesn't know, net zero is all about, um, and that is a goal for companies to get to net zero, to get to zero emissions through reduction strategies. And then the final piece of that is once you've gone ahead and reduced all you can. So for instance, an example would be you um, in a physical space, you're pursuing energy efficiency opportunities to get that electrical consumption um, number down as much as you can. You're doing LED retrofits. You've got all ENERGY STAR rated appliances. Um, every, any opportunity you had to bring the electricity consumption down. You've got all your equipment plugged into smart plugs that get rid of um, vampire or phantom load when they're not in use. Um, after you do that, maybe let's say you've then gone ahead and purchased renewable energy credits um, or RECs to actually green the electricity supply that you are left actually consuming. At the very end of that, um, you know, you might have some things left over where you where you purchase offsets. Um, and so a realistic timeline for that, that's going to depend on your business. But what I can say is there, you can't get started towards a net zero goal until you first measure where you are today, right? And understand where your numbers are coming in. And then critical to net zero is managing those numbers. Um, you know, I do think oftentimes, and this is, um, there's a, you know, a bit of a debate around offsets out there because they are sometimes seen as a band-aid to the problem because if businesses can just continue to emit and just offset their emissions and say, oh, you know, we're supporting projects that remove carbon from the atmosphere or that avoid other businesses from emitting carbon, um, you know, you're kind of putting a little bit of a bandaid on it and you're not really, if you're not bringing down your own numbers, you're still emitting the same amount of carbon into the air. So really managing and bringing those numbers down is what's so critically important before you move to that last step of offsetting what's truly unavoidable and you're not able to mitigate or manage. Um, so I unfortunately don't, can't give you a timeline that's going to be reflective to every business, but what I can say is that it's critical to start measure and managing so that you can determine, okay, what is a realistic timeline for us to have this goal? Could we be net zero by 2030? Could we be net zero by 2050? And really understanding um, how your business can approach that. Recommended frameworks to follow when determining parameters to track as a baseline. Um, I think what I'm getting here is what kind of frameworks exist to help kind of anchor your programs and goals. Um, and I do encourage everyone to take advantage of that free trial we're giving and sustain all of our actions, all that step-by-step -step guidance of how to frame sustainability, how to build these programs, how to take these initiatives. They're all mapped against um, five leading industry standards and frameworks that again, really anchor users programs across um, these, these leading standards. And so that includes from a reporting standpoint, something like GRI, the Global Reporting Initiative, which is the oldest um, reporting initiative in sustainability in existence, um, and also the largest and most widely and universally used. Um, so you can start to see how these frameworks um, ask or kind of provide the structure for businesses to disclose um, this performance so that their baseline can be measured against peers and other businesses in similar industries taking similar steps. Okay, what data is typically collected and how is it best used as a metric to evaluate company performance at reducing greenhouse gases? Great question. I'm seeing a lot around here about data collection, which is really interesting. So again, um, if you check out the calculators, which I, I think I might have actually failed to mention, mention, the emissions tracker is completely free and it's open. So please, I invite everyone to go and check it out. As you go and engage with those different calculators, you'll always see the estimate path of, okay, I don't have data, but I can tell you a little bit about my business. I can tell you where it's located. I can tell you how big it is. I can tell you what kind of, you know, what kind of building it is, if, you know, if that's appropriate. I can tell you how many employees we have or workers in this space. 
And then again, if you just hit that toggle for how to est or for how to um, calculate with real data, you'll see the type of data that they're looking for. So business travel, for example, you'll see how many miles are you taking on um, domestic flights? How many miles in aggregate are you, is your workforce taking on international flights? So we provide that framework of how to collect that data right there in the calculators. And again, if you're looking for a little bit more context on these things, you can check out our action content, which provides more um, more step by step guidance on how to approach this, how to collect the data, who in your organization to ask for it, what stakeholders to include and engage. So much of sustainability in my experience um, is about not operating in a silo and actually leveraging other team members, other departments at your organization that are often owners of this information. A lot of this information finance owns, a lot of it your office um, administrator or office manager might own in terms of your operations. So, so by understanding what questions to ask, then you'll find that you know, there's, there's data that's available that can help you engage with these kind of calculators. And where you don't have data, again, you'll start to see the thread of, okay, this is what I need to start collecting. We need to start doing an annual or a monthly commuter survey and having those tools to directly engage with your workforce and get those numbers over time. Okay, let's see what else we've got here. Great questions today, guys. This is, this is great. Okay, okay, I think I've actually hit most of these. Um, let's see. Yes, I, I'm seeing some specific questions. What skill set or expertise do I ideally need to calculate one, two, and three? Great question. Um, well, what we're hoping is that you don't need much, and that's honestly what who we've built this platform for. There are frankly, tools out there that really require you to be such an expert in this field and really understand such nuance um, and meticulous details. And what we really want to do and sustain is we want to support you. We want to upskill your existing workforce to be able to start engaging with emissions accounting and sustainability at large for your organization, understanding energy efficiency, understanding water saving opportunities, understanding um, how to build from a policy side, um, you know, uh, programs that from a cultural standpoint, can really have an impact on your office operations and your entire workforce, which again, everything your workforce does, it's included in that scope three number. So we've really directed the product to be accessible and approachable um, for everybody. Um, and I've just looked at my, my clock here and I, I think we're, we're a bit over time, but I think I was able to get to um, most of these. Um, how is data procured for scope three emissions? Does the reporting company need to manually request it from suppliers? That's actually a great question. That is a feature that we have built into the app. So um, I'm glad who, the anonymous attendee who asked this, I'm thrilled. Um, we actually built into the app. Um, we're seeing that a lot, that customers or certain large customers that um, have mandates either from their own corporate standpoint or maybe it's pressure coming from their investors, but they need to report on their total emissions. And scope one and two, those things they control, that's a piece of it, but we all know scope three, that's really the bulk of it. And scope three really applies throughout your value chain. So these customers, and for an example, we can talk about a company like Walmart, which has project Gigaton, which is trying to remove a gigaton of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, I think by 2030. Um, and how do they do that? There's certain, certain things they can do for their stores, right? Um, in, in assets and operations that they own and control, but so much of that actually comes from their suppliers and everybody through their supply chain. And so they push these requirements down. And so what we've built into the app is actually an entire supplier module where you can engage with your suppliers and you can get a sense um, also of some um, ESG data in terms of their values and their practices around labor, um, and fair working conditions, um, as well as some of those more environmental things. Do they track emissions? Can they provide you emissions? So we've built that functionality in app as well to help you engage um, with your suppliers to better inform your scope three. And okay, I'm going to cut it there because I do think I've gone over, but um, thank you so much, everyone, for your time today. I hope you found this helpful. Um, let's see, I think I have one more closing slide here. Um, thank you. I do want to mention um, we are launching a brand new community. Um, it's community.sustainlife, um, where we are inviting um, green team members we're starting with, but those that are interested in just forming a community to talk to others, get some questions answered, 
like I've said, there's so much collaboration that ha happens in this space. And just hearing how many of your questions were actually similar around what kind of data do I need to engage in this? Um, please, we invite you all to join so that you can learn from each other and, and get better context, frankly, on, on where businesses are in this process, because it's okay if you haven't quite figured it out. The truth is nobody's figured it out or else we wouldn't be here, right? Um, and there's so much value in just engaging with each other um, and leveraging the experiences and the challenges and the lessons learned from other businesses and just being able to speak confidently about how you're looking at your businesses. And even if you don't have the answer where you are along in that journey and the questions that you're starting to ask and the investigations that you're starting to pursue. So thank you all so much. It was a pleasure. I wish you all the best for your day and um, we hope to see you on Sustain Life.